intellectualism and his knowledge on the conservative movement is, is nearly unparalleled, um, <coughs> especially for the stage. He's currently the CEO uh, and co-founder of the independent Cornerstone Schools in Detroit. Cornerstone seeks to provide a Christ-centered, excellent education for the children of the city. Over 1,000 students now attend Cornerstone at five schools. As a result of his work at Cornerstone, he was named Michiganian of the Year by the Detroit News and was awarded an Honorary Doctor of Humanities from Lawrence Technological University. In 94, he was elected to the State Board of Education in Michigan and became president of the board at the outset of his term. He stepped down in 1999 in order to work more directly with inner city children. He soon thereafter became president of the New Common School Foundation whose purpose is to create an urban school prototype of educational excellence that enhances teaching, learning, personal responsibility, and community involvement. In 1984, President Reagan nominated Clark to the board of the Legal Services Corporation. He was confirmed by the U.S. Senate and served four years as chairman. He has been a Republican nominee for the Michigan Supreme Court and has been a candidate for the U.S. Senate. He was one of the four national co-chairs for Jack Kemp's presidential campaign. Under the recommendation of then Secretary of Transportation Elizabeth Dole, Durant served as bankruptcy trustee of the Ann Arbor Railroad for five years during the 1980s. He turned a state-owned, state-subsidized railroad with close to $100 million in claims into a profitable private sector business with new management, improved track conditions, and a framework for new labor agreements. His reorganization plan provided full payment for all four claims. He serves on both the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and the Michigan Chamber of Commerce boards. He and his wife Susan have four wonderful children, and they also have one granddaughter, Susan Elizabeth. For many years, Clark was a Little League baseball coach, and he hopes to be once again, and we're certainly honored to have him here with us this evening. Please welcome Clark Durant. Clark, it's on my shelf, 
And I just thought I'd read to you what uh, Bill said on June 16, 1973, in a little note that he then prepared for each of our rooms. He said, Chambers was, above all, a poet, with a poet's understanding of political affairs, which is both good and bad. Good if you know and like and learn from the poet's vision. Disastrous if you read a poet the way you would read the Kinsey Report. <laughs> with a dramatist understanding of political affairs, which is again both good and bad, no one could with any success extract a Weltschauen or a way of life or a vision from Chambers' writings complete with neat and elegant trim. No more than you could from Bertolt Brecht or Alexander Pope, both politically minded men of letters. It's a good thing I, Susan and I never got divorced. I don't know how I'd ever top that uh, if I was to ever marry again, and I don't have any plans of that. But I think what Bill was trying to capture, and what I want to try to share with you a little bit tonight, about really one of the most profound books that was ever written in the 20th century, Witness. Uh, by Whitaker Chambers is just that, that Chambers was a poet. He saw more deeply into things than the normal material things. It's like if you look at this uh, piece of wood and you see a shelf, but in point of fact, if you could penetrate it with the poet's eyes and you think of the trees that were grown and how they were nurtured and the seedlings, all of which were shaped in different ways in the hands of the laborers who brought them uh, to, to market and to shape them into something that was useful for human people. Uh, to see a thing in its whole pattern of its existence, uh, not just at any particular moment in time, but when you do see something at a particular moment in time, you see it more deeply than it just appears on the outside. Because Chambers recognized that the most powerful thing is the invisible is the invisible sense of who we are in our very essence and our souls. Many people, if you go back, if you want to go on the internet and read, let me give a little bit of the factual background, but in one sense it's the most important, and in another sense it's the least important. Chambers, when he was a student at Columbia uh, University, you know, like I suppose a lot of students was, you know, just searching, who am I? What am I about? What do I want to be? And was attracted to the writings of Marx and others. Uh, ultimately, seeing in this, you know, we, we criticize, you know, Marx and Nietzsche and, and, and others of the left in different ways. But what really Chambers said is the great attraction is that it gives the person a sense of purpose. Now, you may say it's a disjointed purpose. But every human purpose, every human person is looking for me. Who am I? What am I about? Why do I exist? And every human person, whether you know it or not, has a poet's mind. Rarely does a human person think in a linear way. When you look at a guy sitting there with a Michigan shirt, you see, you might see blonde hair and blue jeans, but you say, okay, what's it about the Michigan thing? What's the relationship? What are all the pieces that would go around that particular person? And when you see with a poet's eyes, you see all the invisible things that may have brought this person to sit in that chair tonight. And that's a journey that every person is on. When Chambers writes in the opening letter, he calls it a letter to his children, uh, he refers to it in which a fallen human beings, 
you can look around and you're going to see the ugliness that exists because of that. The way people mistreat each other. The way people judge people on externalities, whether it's their race or their ethnic background or their religion or their economics or whatever it may be. And everybody recognizes that the, in the imperfections of life, there must be a solution. There must be a way of alleviating that suffering, that injustice. And what the communist offers is a reason to die for something. Let me ask you a question. Tell me what any of you would be willing to die for. What would you be willing to die for? My children. I'm sorry? My children. Your children. What else? Children. What else? Country. Country. Faith. Faith. Freedom. Freedom. It's very interesting that the whole idea of witness or martyrdom is, is that, and it's why the title of the book, it ultimately, it, for all of us, that's why this is really, each for each of us, it is our own autobiography. The details that you'll find in this book, which is, the, which is this is the copy of the book I, when I first read with this, uh, when I was in college. Um, and the reason Chambers chose that term was that every human person has to one day really every day you are a witness not against something but for something and if you are a witness in the Greek sense of tragedy you are a martyr in other words you are willing to whatever it is that you are in the most fundamental way witnessing for are you willing to die for and ultimately that's what what Chambers talks about in, 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 in the, you know most people when the book first came out saw it as a a great spy thriller. And it really is. If you get the book, and I encourage you to get the book, uh, it really is a great spy thriller. But it's not why Chambers wrote the book. Probably the most famous uh, part of um, the most famous part of this book is the beginning. And one small part of the middle begins it very simply. Beloved children, I am sitting in the kitchen of the little house in Medfield. Our second farm, which is cut off by the ridge and a quarter mile across the fields from our home place where you are. I am writing a book. In it, I am speaking to you, but I am also speaking to the world. To both, I owe an accounting. Let me, before I go any farther with this, let me give you a little bit more of the facts. When he was in Columbia, he never graduated. He was recruited by a friend uh, to begin to write for the, uh, uh, the Daily Worker. Chambers was a very good writer, and he began to write for the Daily Worker, you know, different kinds of pieces as to, you know, what the party was up to and all the rest. Uh, as this went on over uh, a period of time, he was ultimately recruited to go into the underground, which meant cutting yourself off, you know, from all your friends, your relatives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and uh, Chambers was married uh, and wasn't going to go alone. Uh, so, but he never told his wife initially, you know, what his life was really about. And what he became is basically. Um, we call it a modern vernacular a runner. Uh, he would be the point of contact for agents of the Soviet Union that were in different parts of the government uh, of the United States. And it really is fascinating how deep that really penetrated. The, the main character in the great drama of this trial was a man named Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was a very well-bred, well-educated uh, Harvard lawyer uh, who went on to clerk uh, for Felix Frankfurter uh, and was at Roosevelt's side in Yalta uh, at the uh, end of uh, World War II, uh, was in San Francisco to set up the United Nations in the original charter in the first meeting, uh, 
as prominent and well-bred, uh, loved classical music, was a refined uh, man. If you saw him, you would say he was a sophisticated man. Uh, and yet behind, and that's why I say the invisible, behind that veneer was a man who was systematically giving confidential information, uh, classified information from the State Department uh, to Chambers and to others, but primarily to Chambers. The Chambers then dutifully, you know, passed on to his point of contact in the uh, uh, in the underground. In fact, when the wall fell, when the Berlin Wall fell, and the Soviet Union began to come apart, uh, there was a book, there was a number of books that were published, one called the Verona Papers, uh, a variety of black book of communism, whatever, that actually identified a number of these people from the Soviets' perspective that these people were actually working uh, for the KGB. And uh, so Chambers built up this friendship, this friendship with Alger Hiss. Uh, Alger Hiss sold him a car. Alger Hiss, um, let Chambers and his wife use their apartment. Um, and in fact, that intimacy of the relationship ultimately was what was so convincing when this all came public. This was mostly uh, through the 30s, uh, when, uh, before, by the way, Hiss was with Roosevelt at Yalta, and before he was in 1945 in San Francisco with the United Nations. So all this time, this very distinguished, well-trained, well-connected Harvard lawyer um, was passing these documents to the Soviets. And here is Chambers, a pudgy, unattractive, uh, rounded face man uh, as the vehicle by which this was happening. And Chambers had a, uh, and he describes it with great poetry. Uh, this, in fact, let me see if I can find it. He describes the moment when uh, uh, he describes the moment when all of a sudden uh, he realized that he was on the wrong side. I date my break from a very casual happening. I was sitting in our apartment on St. Paul Street in Baltimore. It was shortly before we moved to Alger Hiss's apartment in Washington. My daughter was in her high chair. I was watching her eat. She was the most miraculous thing that had ever happened in my life. I liked to watch her even when she smeared porridge on her face or dropped it meditatively on the floor. My eye came to rest on the delicate, convolutions of her ear, those infinite, perfect ears. The thought passed through my mind, no, those ears were not created by any chance coming together of atoms in nature. They could have only been created by an immense design. That thought was an, involunt <clears throat> an involuntary one and unwanted. I crowded it out of my mind, but I never wholly forgot it or the occasion. I had to, I had to cry, crowd it out of my mind because if I had completed the thought, I should have had to have said, design presupposes God. And I did not know that at that moment, the finger of God was first laid upon my forehead. Ultimately, Chambers writes that the struggle between he and his was ultimately a struggle between a faith in man or a faith in God. And the immense power of man's mind to create whole worlds and whole rationalizations for every action. And ultimately, it really is the very drama of the second oldest faith in the world. which is what the serpent tempted Eve with. You can be as God. And what Chambers saw then in 
the struggle that he was going to have with his own set of beliefs at that time is how do you let go of that? We may sit here in the comfort of this auditorium and say, well, it's just a matter of the intellect. Just a matter of mind. Let's just think it through. Ideas have consequences. But the reason the word was made flesh was a recognition that ultimately it's the experience that ties us and binds us. And that's what Whitaker Chambers was going through. After he made the decision to leave the underground, which was a very dangerous thing to do, which was a very dangerous thing to do, he and his wife went down to Florida to hide, stayed down there, uh, I don't remember exactly how long, but stayed down in Florida to try to uh, not be available to uh, those who might want to kill him, because clearly he knew a number of the people uh, that were involved in the underground, Harry Dexter White, who was an assistant secretary of the Treasury, Elizabeth Bentley, and other people. Um, ultimately, Chambers was, for whatever reason, I don't remember, and it is in the book, um, ultimately Chambers was able to go to work as a copy clerk at Time Magazine. And he rose during the 40s to become a senior editor and the foreign policy editor of Time Magazine. And if you ever go on the internet and want to find some old times, um, you'll see that Whitaker Chambers has you know, signed pieces in those Time magazines. In fact, Life magazine, uh, which was owned by Henry Luce also, uh, has some fascinating, I've got a couple at home, have a fascinating articles. Uh, Chambers knew 12 languages, was fluent in 12 languages, uh, was immensely well-read man. And his articles on, on the history of the church, his articles on different intellectual uh, conflicts that have occurred over the years. Uh, you know, Henry Lewis just drew on that. Then one day, in 1948, uh, for lots of reasons that I won't go into here, the Congress of the United States was beginning to explore the extent of the penetration of the Soviet apparatus in the United States government. And the House on American uh, Activities Committee was holding these hearings and were bringing up these lower level functionaries, if you will, to sort of testify. Some wouldn't testify, frankly. But in that, in the course of that, Whitaker Chambers' name came up. Um, and so he was subpoenaed. He did not want to go. He was now a prominent editor at Time Magazine. Uh, but at the end of the day, with subpoena power and everything else of that sort, he had no choice. And I think it was in August, early August of 1948, uh, Chambers testifies uh, before Congress or before the Committee of Congress. And was reluctant to say very much other than just to answer the question that was asked. As a trial lawyer, you know that you never want to ask a question you don't know the answer to of a witness. Um, and, but also, if you're representing the defendant, you always tell them, do not answer a question that hasn't been asked of you. And that's really what Chambers was going to do. He didn't want to go into any of that. He was not, he still saw Alger and Priscilla, uh, his, his wife, Priscilla Hiss, as friends, um, and some of the other people. But ultimately, it was drawn out of him, and he began to tell his story. Well, needless to say, it was a huge revelation. And so Alger Hiss um, was contacted and asked to testify. Now remember, at that point in Alger Hiss's career, uh, he was an advisor to Truman. Uh, he was, as I say, a man of impeccable credentials. But here to go before Congress and answer questions about being a Soviet spy? Balderdash. So Hiss goes to testify and denies even knowing Chambers. Denies even knowing Chambers. And with a self-righteousness that was very convincing. I mean, after all, given his credentials, his training, everything else, uh, he could be a very persuasive man. So here you have two men. One, the person that you would think would be the all-American boy, 
well-educated, well-dressed, uh, and this, I'm not letting them have a picture here, but this unattractive, um, uh, would it have changed? And so the committee was confronted with who do you believe? Who do you believe? One is either deeply deceptive, Because if Chambers is right, then everything begins to crumble. So all the best people were with Algernus. All the best people were with Algernus. There was a young congressman on that committee who had just been elected to Congress in 19, I think it was 52, it may have been 50. Uh, and his name was Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon, um, a trial lawyer uh, before uh, uh, being elected to Congress, uh, truly took the bull by the horns. Not because he knew which one was right. If you read the transcripts, if you read the history, it really is fascinating. It was a matter of really trying to search for the truth and the different kinds of things that, that the committee was faced with. Because if this was true about his, then the penetration by the Soviet uh, government into the United States was much broader and deeper than had been commonly understood. But as Chambers constantly is pointing out, it still is not a spy story. It's still not a story really of espionage. That's the backdrop. What he says, ultimately was a battle of two faiths. And it's fascinating. He says ultimately it is a challenge. Are we going to choose God or man? Communists will continue to give the choice of man and defend it with the passion. Defend it with the passion of a disciple. You know, we always say, well, you know, it's not what you say, it's whether you're sincere. Sincerely wrong. And so the question is, is to try to discern what is truth. It's not only the question that Pilate asked, it's the question that Socrates asked. It's the question that every human person, frankly, has to ask of themselves. And it's why it's really a tribute to each of you that you're even participating in a really a wonderful class like this. I mean, I think it's terrific what Randall and everybody else has been doing to really try to stir up a better understanding, not only of ideas, but really of our own lives. You know, this isn't just sort of an interesting little exercise, oh, I might have read this book. Uh, it really is trying to define who we are. The, uh, I wish I could find this, and I will in just a second.
communists or that part of mankind which has recovered the power to live or die to bear witness for its faith. And it is a simple, rational faith that inspires men to live or die for. It is rare that you'll ever meet a communist who thinks he's wrong. In fact, he'll try to persuade you that you are. And he'll think you're the one that isn't using your reason. He'll think you're the one that's not using your heart. He'll think you're the one that is unjust. And you have to say to yourself, how can the same flesh and blood come to such totally opposite conclusions about the very nature of man? Chambers saw and thought that he was coming to the losing side. He thought that the West had lost its sense of conviction of what birthed them in the first place. He thought that we would become so overwhelmed with the material things and the material explanation of the world that we would lose our sense of purpose. And any time that happens, whoever in battle of the, either the mind or the body, whoever is relentless in their purpose will generally overwhelm the one who is not. And the interesting thing that Jesus teaches is, is that in the great paradox of strength is that it is in the humility of loving another that can transform the evil that resists and resides in, even in our own individual human hearts. It's the great paradox of existence. And Chambers touches on that all throughout the story. But one of the things that is so noble about this, what ultimately would happen, uh, the statute of limitations, uh, ultimately the committee determined, based on all the evidence, that his had to have been lying. And one of the things that, um, because, uh, you know, Alger Hiss said, I'm going to have this libel suit against Whitaker Chambers, it took him a couple of months before he actually filed it. Uh, never won the case, but ultimately, Alger Hiss was charged with perjury, giving testimony, false testimony under oath in front of that congressional hearing. And the first trial, because he had all the money and all the right people, he was represented by a very effective defense lawyer by the name of John Paul Stryker. And Chambers had a run-of-the-mill prosecutor out of the Justice Department by a man named Thomas Murphy who was not well prepared just because of time issues and everything else, when the case first came to trial. And the first trial, which took place, I think, in, in 49, uh, the first trial, uh, the jury came back as a hung jury. The second trial, because it was there for a mistrial, the second trial, this Thomas Murphy uh, totally got into the case and understood all of its ramifications. Uh, and the jury came back and found out that he was guilty of having perjured himself under oath. And you might say that uh, brings it all to conclusion, but for more than 60 years, people are still fighting in his case. When his went to prison and when he came out, he wrote a book. All the best people come around him still. Oh, he's a man of culture. He's a man of refinement. How, he's a man of good education. How could this be evil? Just meet him. C.S. Lewis said the wonderful thing. I think it's in the screw tape letters. Uh, evil never comes looking up. Otherwise, we wouldn't be tempted by it. It always comes looking to track it. And here was this man, and, and, and the, I don't know, has anybody ever heard of the pumpkin papers? Do you know what the pumpkin papers are? Yes, sir. Uh, he, he, uh, Whitaker Chambers, I believe, hid the evidence that uh, exonerated him inside a pumpkin or something. Well, what he did was, that's very good. Uh, he had taken with him when he decided to leave the uh, underground, knowing that he you know, might one day need these. Uh, he took a, uh, a number of papers that had been microfilmed. Uh, and initially they were hid in, the, uh, in an, uh, an elevator shaft, not an elevator shaft, what's a, a dumb waiter, dumb waiter shaft, 
in a, in a cousin's apartment, I think it was in Connecticut or, or Upper New York State, when he went to get them years later, I mean, that was in the 30s, and this trial is now in the, in the uh, 49, I think. Um, you know, they're all dusty, whether they're even there in this box or whatever, he finds them. And then to protect them, he has a farm in Maryland, Pipe Creek Farm. Uh, and he takes them and he figures, I might as well hide them where nobody will look. And he hides them in a pumpkin patch. He carves out a pumpkin, puts them in, cleans out the pumpkin, puts them in the, uh, uh, into the pumpkin, puts the top on it. And only uh, in the second trial, uh, then do these, does he bring these out uh, to use as a part of the uh, second trial. And it's fascinating to read just the minutia of this trial, and yet how much hung in the balance of this great philosophical struggle that goes through every human heart. And he says about Thomas uh, Murphy, uh, contrast between Thomas Murphy and Richard Nixon and uh, Tom Dunnigan, who was uh, uh, one of the judges of the two trial juries who finally won the his case for the nation. It is important to look hard at them for a moment, and this book would not be complete without such a glance. For the contrast between them and the glittering his forces is about the same as between the glittering French chivalry and the somewhat tattered English bowman who won an agony. The inclusive fact about them is that in contrast to the pro his rally, most of them, regardless of what they had made of themselves, came from the wrong side of the tracks. I use the expression as the highest measure of praise, as Lincoln noted that God must have loved the common people because he made so many of them. For in America, most of us begin on the wrong side of the tracks. The meaning of America, what made it the wonder of history and the hope of mankind, was that we were free not to stay on the wrong side of the tracks. For within us, there was something that empowered us to grow. We were free to grow and go where we could. Only we were not free ever to forget, ever to despise our origins. They were our roots. They, these, made us a nation. And no feature of the his case is more obvious or more troubling than the jagged fissures which it did not so much as open as it did reveal, between the plain men and women of the nation and those who affected to act and think and speak for them. It was not invariably, but in general, the best people who were for Alger Hiss and who were prepared to go to almost any length to protect and defend him. It was the enlightened and the powerful, the clamorous proponents of the open mind and the common man who snapped their minds shut in a pro his psychosis of a kind which in an individual patient means the simple failure of the ability to distinguish between reality and unreality, and in a nation is the warning of the end. And if you think even of some of our political debates today, how hard it is to open up the conversation in a way of really searching as human beings, trying to sort out what is the, the best path, how do you help people to become free, how do we allow families to be nurtured and strengthened and to grow? And yet there's just these closed uh, conversations that really aren't even speaking with each other but at each other. And what needs to be regained is this deeper understanding of who we are as a human person. What God calls us to be in our relationships with each other at the end of the day, it is why the Word was made flesh, to see in fact the way we would form in community, the way we would be free. That is the one thing, you know, in pre being created in the image and likeness of God. When God put the two trees in there, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, one aspect of being in the image of God, that God gave us the ability to say, your will or my will. Because he knew that in the process of us having to decide that, the whole notion of Greek tragedy is that you see uh, a, a person of great skill, of great valor, and great courage, 
great prudence, and yet there's a fatal flaw that brings that man or that woman down. And that's why, uh, ultimately, Chambers saw this as that struggle between who God created us to be and the struggle where we wanted to be our own God. And in the process of deciding right, one of the best books that C.S. Lewis, I think, ever wrote is a little, slim little volume called The Great Divorce. And the reason it's such a powerful little volume is Lewis, in his wonderful way, takes seven uh, ordinary people, just like you and me, uh, and they take an imaginary trip from the, um, from the great world, if you will, to the outskirts of heaven on an old bus. And each person is given the opportunity in their own circumstances to make the decision of whether it's my will or thy will. And only one can overcome that whole sense of hubris, that whole sense of pride, to die self and go, as Lewis says, farther up and further in. And that is what this book is about. And it's in the context of the espionage. It's in the context of a great spy story. It's in the context of seeing the struggle of a free people trying to decide what to do with those who have penetrated. It's the very essence of its government. And I, while well, I understand that uh, there weren't enough copies available or whatever the book, uh, I would encourage you greatly to, uh, uh, to go to Amazon and Buy it on your own nickel. Uh, it is something that you will have on your uh, bookshelves for more than 34 years. Uh, I want to read a poem to you to sort of close and then open it up uh, for questions because I'm really more interested in, in, in what you have to say and what your questions are as we think about these things. That Really, how do we become a society of free men and women that are truly embarking on a very unique experiment in self-government? Do not fool yourselves. If we took, no matter how you calculate it, the time that there has been existence from the creation of the world to this moment, this experiment in freedom in the United States is like, if, it, if you did it over the course of 365 days, it's probably, we're probably on December 31st or December 30th. Now, it's that slim of a time in the history of, of man. And that's why it's such an exhilarating time to be alive. It truly is. Because God has given each and every one of us this opportunity to demonstrate what does self-government. You know, in most classes they talk about self-government, then they talk about the division of you know, the Congress and the executive branch, the judicial branch. Ultimately, the experiment of self-government is self-government. Can we tame the passions of our own hearts? Do not think that any one of us is immune from the temptations of Algerians. The next time you try to control someone else and exert your power over them, you are succumbing to that same temptation. It is not the profound love that is really the core of the very essence of the universe. So we're all in this in a, in a way that it's not something that occurred 60 years ago. It occurs every, every day, every moment, in our own hearts, in our own relationships, wherever we are. And that's why if you each can be leaders in trying to really be a voice, not just in word, but in the flesh, of what this experiment in self-government can really be about, whether it's with the poor, the left out, the alienated, whether they have you know, great wealth or no wealth, whatever it may be, that you become vessels of reconciliation in a way that the human community begins to reflect the very order and purpose of, of, of who we are as people. But the great temptation is, is that I'm the most important thing on the face of the planet, or it's my idea, my ego, my whatever. And Chesterton, um, in a wonderful collection of poems, has, has one entitled The Wise Man. I'd like to read it to you if I could. I, I love Chesterton. Step softly under snow or rain to find the place where men can pray, 
The way is all so very plain that we may lose the way. Oh, we have learned to peer and pour on tortured puzzles from our youth. We know all labyrinth and lore. We, all, we are the three wise men of yore. And we know all things but the truth. We have gone round and round the hill and lost the wood among the trees and learnt long names for every ill and served the mad gods, naming them the Furies rather than the Humanities. That's just very quickly. Humanities was a euphemism that would cover up the reality of what something was. The Furies were these gods that when, when we violated what it was to be pure in spirit and pure in heart and to be courageous, the Furies were sent after us um, to put us back on. Well, nobody liked the name Furies because that really does capture what these, in the Greek sense, the gods were doing. So they called them the Humanities, to cover up reality, not to penetrate what is real. The gods of violence took the veil of vision and philosophy the serpent that brought all men bail, he bites his own accursed tail and calls himself eternity. Go humble. It has hailed and snow with voices low and lanterns lit. So very simple is the road that we may stray from it. The world grows terrible and white and blinding light in the break of day. We walk bewildered in that light, for something is too large for sight, and something much too plain to <coughs> say. The child that was ere the four worlds begun, we need but walk a little way, we need but see a latch undone. The child that played with the moon and the sun is now playing with a little hay. The house from which the heavens are fed, the old strange house that is our own, where tricks of words are never said, and mercy is as plain as bread, and honor hard as stone. Go, humble, humble are the skies, and low and large and fierce the single star, so very near the manger lies that we may travel far. Hark, laughter like a lion wakes to roar to the resounding plain, and the whole heaven shouts and shakes, for God himself is born again, and we are little children walking through the snow.